Welcome to Inspiring Business with your host, Mark Bullock, who is the co-founder of Videosocials.net and of VideoInterviewPodcast.com. In every episode, Mark interviews business and organizational thought leaders who share their stories of how they inspire others by making a difference. You can find this show on Videosocials.net and YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, and almost any podcast platform of your choosing. Welcome, and I am delighted today to have as a guest uh, my friend and a member of Video Socials with us is Eric Fine. Eric is a mediator and is the founder of Fine Mediation Group. He focuses on parenting, divorce, elder and aging, and neurodiversity and special needs. Welcome, Eric. It's so wonderful to have you. Hi, Mark. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. And I know you have a crazy busy schedule, so I really appreciate uh, uh, it, and it took us a while to get this to get this one nailed down. And I, I appreciate the fact that uh, we got it to work. But I really wanted to have you on because you have a pretty unique story. And I would love it if you would share, you know, because I know you're an attorney, but you're f really focused on mediation and I even within that whole neuro neurodiversity and special needs arena. Um, that's highly unique. And so I'd love kind of hear to hear your story, how you came to sure. be. Sure. And thank you. It, 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 it all started, if you want to know, it was a couple of years back. It was when the world went remote <laughs> during the time of COVID. Mm -hmm. I have uh, three kids, a small, medium, and large. My oldest is now graduated <laughs> high school. My middle is in high school. My youngest is in middle school. You go back a couple of years, that was elementary, middle, and high school. And we were all doing things from home like everybody, like everybody else. And all of my kids are neurodivergent. They have different strengths. They have different challenges. And mm -hmm. each one is different from the others in terms of the supports that they need. So when we're doing work, when we were doing school from home, I had one of them in my family room. One was in our dining room and my third was hiding up in her room trying to get some distance from the other two while they did school. Right. And it was, you know, it was a full on job between myself and my wife in terms of being able to support them mm. and what they needed every day in terms of you know what they needed to be able to stay on track mm -hmm. and what that meant as well was what we needed to be able to keep our family train on the tracks and stay on track with each other right for us and for them right we had our we had our stuff going on as well just like again like so so many it, it's complicated parenting is complicated when you add on the additional complexity of having kids that are neurodivergent and have additional needs and supports in the mix, it gets complicated. And there's lots of times and lots of places and all the decisions we need to make every day mm -hmm. where we could lose step with each other. Right. And that's what led me to mediation, which was thinking about how, how fortunate we are today. We live in a world where there are so many supports for our kids, there are, it, and it, it, it's remarkable and it's a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. There's lots of supports as well for us as parents to help our kids. Right. But there's far fewer, if you really think about it, to help us as parents to stay in step with each other. Absolutely. Especially on the day to day. Right. Most, most people, when they think of mediation, and, I, and myself as well, we think about it in terms of divorce. When things reach a point when you're, you're thinking about getting apart, and it's a process for helping people to do that, it absolutely is for that. I'm thinking broader, and that's what led me to create my practice, which is also how can this be a means for helping parents work together, stay together, stay in step and align with each other on all of those big and small issues that if they get if they don't get resolved right. if they don't get worked out in ways that will work for everybody lead to other problems so that that's the genesis of what i'm doing and how i came to do this and and uh, so it's you know it is personal it is family it is uh you know it is what you're dealing with in life and I, I don't want to dwell too much on the past, but I mean, where are you coming from? I mean, you're, you're what, what type of 
what type of business did you have before? What, you know, you're an attorney. I assume you were a practicing attorney. Uh, yep. What were you doing before? You know, you you came to the determination that this is this is the area that you really wanted to focus. Well, I've been I've been an attorney for a long time, more than 25 years. Okay. And actually, my background was in helping. Really, it, it's really helping people find ways to say yes to each other, deals, negotiations, helping people when they want to be able to say yes and work together mm -hmm. with some help getting there. And that to me, it, it, at the end of the day, you have all of the details about what the substance is, what's in front of you, what the particular issues might be, but it's about the people. Right. And it's about how you bring them to the table right? and walk with them, even as an attorney, to be able to say, where do we want to go? How mm -hmm. do we get there and how do we find a way to do that that builds a collaboration, builds a relationship? So for me, it was a natural progression in terms of what I've been doing for so long to say, you know what, we, we can apply this to parenting. We can apply this to families. Right. Right. And um, I, I don't know if you know, but, you know, I, about 12, 13 years ago or so, I met my first divorce mediator uh, who became a client of, of, of practice marketing and, and her name's Ada Haslocker and Ada has become a very close friend um, and, and, and been a client for a long, long time. Um, but, you know, she brought us into the world and we got involved in, in the various mediation organizations, uh, both nationally as well as uh, in, in New York State. Um, and, uh, and I drank the Kool-Aid. Um, and not the and, and not the least of which was because um, we're closing a chapter. If somebody's getting a divorce, they're closing a chapter of their relationship. But especially if they have kids, they're not closing the relationship. They just need to morph it into something else because they're still going to be parents to their kids. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, for that reason, I think mediation, especially if you have children, needs to be a first option rather than the alternative option. Um, I, I would love it if uh, alternative dispute resolution professionals could eliminate the word alternative because I think it should be the first um, thing to be considered. And it's of course not gonna work for everyone, especially in, in highly contentious uh, situations, major substance abuse, you know, uh, uh, violence, um, it, you know, things like that, that it may not be, uh, it could be a part of, but may not be the, the end all. Um, but what types of issues do you address both in, you know, divorce as well as, uh, especially in the, in the whole, um, neurodiverse and special needs arena? Well, let me, let me, before I answer that, Mark, and, and just, okay. I, I agree fully with you on this. Mm -hmm. And I think, what mediation is about. It, it's, it's about creating options. It's mm. creating opportunities, right? It doesn't have to be that you're doing it at an end point where things are already in crisis mode. It can also be preventive. This is, a, I, th I think it's a very powerful process for being able to sit down together and say, you know what, we have a sense of where we wanna go. Maybe my vision is different than your vision, but it's the how, how we, bridge those differences. It's not that we disagree. That's the issue so often. It's how we disagree. And being able to provide a process that provides some structure, that provides some bumpers to, to improve the how and keep things focused on what's important, even when it's hard, even when it's hard to communicate, even when emotions might be running high, to be able right. to do that, I, I think it can be such a such a powerful tool to have in your toolbox and that's part of what what i know we've talked about this previously that's part of what drives me it's part of my why is being able to help that so the issues right. in divorce you know and it, it's it can be everything from dealing with separation if you take the entire timeline of divorce when you're moving from a time when you're separating mm -hmm. being able to negotiate what that might look like and help support coming to agreement on what the issues are for a separation. When you reach divorce, it's dealing with the parenting, the co-parenting and the parenting plan, dealing with how you're going to address questions of how you're going to spend time and how your kids will spend time with each of you, how you make decisions, even when you're apart, how you provide consistency, all of those types of issues. I'm speaking 
high level. Of course, there's right. lots of detail that goes mm -hmm. below that. It's also about property. You're now moving from one household to two. So how you're going to allocate, how you're going to make decisions about who's going to have what going forward. And then it's also then the financial discussions go along with that. And that's everything from the finances and what you have mm -hmm. and the finances of what things will look like in the future. And that includes things like support. It includes things like how you make sure you have enough. You're each going to have enough now that you're moving from one household to another configuration. And I like what you said, Mark, as well. You're going to be parents for the rest of your lives or their lives. Right? It's a different situation. But right. even when you're divorced, you're still going to need to make decisions together. And mediation, I think, and as a mediator, one of the things I value is being able to help people come together, right. even when it's difficult to have those conversations and say, okay, what needs to be done, right? And how do they get there? How do we get there? Right. Absolutely. Well, and, and one of the things that you've done is uh, you've created a lot of content uh, around you know, trying to give people tips and ideas and suggestions. Uh, and, uh, you know, so your website, fingmediationgroup.com. Um, you're on LinkedIn, Eric M. Fine. Your uh, Facebook is uh, uh, Fine Mediation Group. And your YouTube channel is Fine Mediation Group. Um, and there'll be links, folks, for uh, all of these uh, ways of connecting with Eric. Um, uh, associated with this podcast and, and whatever platform you're consuming it through, uh, so you don't need to remember it all. It's all going to it's all going to be in, uh, in the descriptions, etc. Um, but along with that, I mean, it's unusual to say the least um, for a um, mediator, a divorce mediator, or any other kind of mediator to have a YouTube channel, right? So. Um, I think you came about that in part, um, or at least expanded on that uh, through your association with our sponsor of today, which is videosocials.net, yes. which I'm the co-founder of. Um, and videosocials.net is a very simple concept, and that is, is that being on camera and sharing information, knowledge, et cetera, creating content that is makes a difference. Uh, for those that might consume it, whether they ultimately become clients or whether they, it just be um, you uh, putting stuff out there in the ether that, that can that can help people make a difference in the world. Um, whatever your reasoning for doing it, um, being on camera is not natural. Uh, it's not it's not something that no. that a lot of people find uh, themselves being comfortable with. And even if they are, you know, that gregarious and outgoing and and, and find themselves being comfortable on camera, they don't necessarily know the best ways to present themselves, how to uh, present information, how to have a conversation with an audience rather than talking to an inanimate object called a camera. So we created the video socials concept out of, we don't do it on our own, sitting there trying to find the time to schedule to, uh, to talk to that inanimate object. Uh, we get together as a group. Uh, in, in small groups, usually uh, five to 10 people. And we take turns uh, recording our short videos that we use on our websites, we use for social media, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, borrowing a little bit from the concept of Toastmasters, which is again, it's peers getting together and practicing with each other and giving each other feedback um, so that we improve and we get practiced and we get comfortable and, and we learn how to have authentic conversations with an audience uh, to allow them to get to know, like, and trust us without ever having met us. Um, but uh, what is your experience, Eric, with, with video socials and, 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 and why, why did you join and what has it meant for you? It's the, for me, it's the community. It's the, and, and you hit it on the head, Mark. It's the practice and it's the feedback. Look, right. we're all, especially online, we're doing so much of this ourselves. Right. Right. And we're in our own heads and we don't necessarily get feedback until we put things out there. Right. So it's that ability to practice in an environment where we're among friends mm -hmm. and the feedback is intended and designed to be helpful and make us better each time. I, I value that 
so greatly. So each opportunity that I have to work with the team and to work with the group for me is an opportunity to try things out mm -hmm. and to get a little better than I was the last time. I think that is so key and it becomes iterative, right? It, it, it's continually improving on what we've done before, I hope. And also being able to get the feedback to say, you know what, am I talking about something that's interesting to anybody but me? I think it is. But getting that instant feedback from the group as well, I think is so valuable. And I, and I wanted to acknowledge you because I, I know you've been incredibly busy this, uh, this last few months and, and haven't been able to attend much. But uh, um, yeah, you, like every other member that we have, you know, the flip side of that coin is, is that when you're giving that feedback, when you're giving that support, you're giving that encouragement, you're making a difference for the other members. So it, it is it is a all get all around, uh, as my friend Ada would say, um, where we um, uh, we're there to support and encourage each other. And it is about relationships. And it, and it, it, and and um, we're not a networking organization, but I have seen some of the most powerful networking I've ever experienced uh, just through my involvement in, in video socials as a member, not just the co-founder of it. So um, it's videosocials.net and we'd love to have you as a guest. Just click at the, the, the guest tab at the top of the, uh, top of the uh, screen on videosocials.net. And Eric, uh, I did want to get into one of the other areas that you um, also are a little bit unique in the fact that you offer elder and family mediation services. And, and what does that involve and, and, and how is that different than you know, divorce or separation type of mediation? Sure. And it's, I, I call it family with a capital F. Divorce, <laughs> divorce, divorce is a process, uh -huh. right? It, it is a process that has a formal beginning, middle and end in mm -hmm. terms of the process itself. But if you were putting it, let's say on a timeline, mm -hmm. you have everything that comes before, you have everything that comes after. And like I said, a big, the central aspect of what brought me to mediation was starting with parents and starting with parenting and the neurodivergence and being able to support all of those additional complexities, whether it's the decisions about how we support our kids, you know, it might be about the getting evaluations, medical decisions, it might be about therapeutics, it might be educational decisions, logistics, how we get people from here, there, who does what, where, when, and how all of that now if you take that farther and look now towards the family in the expanded sense so you have your family which is your small we in my family we call it our small family mm -hmm. and then how we relate adult siblings parents parent child relationships so as our parents get older i'm sure you've heard the term sandwich generation <laughs> I'm in, so I'm many living. of us. <laughs> so many. Of, it, it's not easy to live in that, yeah. and it's a lot. You're taking care of your own family, and you're also finding yourselves in a role where now your parents are needing support too, mm -hmm. one or both, and things are changed. So there's changing roles, mm -hmm. the needs are changing, right? And it can be hard to have conversations together as a family. And I say it again with a capital F, right? about those needs and how we're going to do it. So it might be that you have one family member becomes the primary caregiver or the go-to person, the first person that gets called when there's a need. And then there might be another family member that's handling other issues as the lead and others are support. So how do you stay in step with each other? How do you keep each other informed? How do you communicate? How do you make decisions together as your parents might be stepping back and as the now adult children, sandwich generation, balancing mm -hmm. your family, your needs, your time, your capabilities, and their needs. And doing it in a way where, you know what, if, you're, if you have siblings where you're not fighting the battles from when you were 15 years old that are being brought up by the fact <laughs> that now you have to make decisions together right. without your parents yeah. facilitating or with your parents in a different role. So again, I, I view as a mediator, being able as someone to come in as someone who is neutral, to be able to provide that structure, that process that as you decide on what the issues are, to be able to say, how do we get there from here? 
What does that look like? Who's doing what? How do we keep each other in the loop? Big and small decisions, the planning decisions that come up, right. how to get ahead of them when you can, if that's what you want to do, or when the future becomes now, how you deal with them when it's in front of you. And right. again, it might be, it might be times where some or all of you are stressed out and it's just hard. So that's, that's what brought me to this. It started with parenting, mm -hmm. but then it became the question of how do we support the family in all the ways that that can be, all the ways that those issues can come up. Right. Well, and um, I don't want to get too deep into it, but literally um, full-time caregiver for my elderly mother um, and I still have adult children uh, living at home. So I, I literally, our family is the very definition. My wife and I are the very definition of the sandwich generation. Um, and there's been a lot of decisions, conflicts, trying to figure out what's the right thing to do because I am the primary um, and uh, not only the right thing, you know, for mom, but the right thing for my wife and I and the rest of the family mm -hmm. and the broader family uh, around that, um, especially as, as uh, you know, mom is not able to make the same kinds of decisions, but also still has preferences about how, she wants to live her life, et cetera. Um, and um, I will say it is probably the most difficult thing that I've ever done in my life, um, trying to balance it all. So I acknowledge you for being there for those that are in that position. Um, and sometimes folks, it just helps to have another ear. It helps to have somebody that can recognize all of those intersects and all of those choices that need to be made and 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 the ability to to um, discharge some of the inevitable frustration irritation uh, <laughs> you know um, family histories you know from when we were kids that you know can can can, can really get in the way um, so um, thank you for taking it on because there aren't many uh, elder mediators out there um, and, I, and I think it's a field that one needs to be expanded, um, two is needs, needs to, um, needs to have more community outreach and, and, and people that are living with the big F family, uh, and, and, and are either approaching or in the middle of some level of caregiving, et cetera, um, that whole role reversal that you that, that 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 you mentioned before is 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 one of the biggest because we find ourselves as children who are parents and grandparents now becoming in some ways in a shifting role to to more or less parenting of our own parents and that it's it's a very strange dichotomy to live through um and i appreciate the fact that you know you're there to support people that are going through that Thank you, Mark. And I, and I appreciate your sharing that. It's, I can imagine how complicated this is, how difficult it is. It can be all consuming at times. Absolutely. And part of the challenge, I think, is what, is what you're describing. It's, it's how do we stay in step? Mm -hmm. How do we do it in a way where everybody who's involved, well, to do it in a way that's constructive, where we're not just second guessing because perhaps we don't know what's mm -hmm. going on. Sometimes an issue that comes up in the room in mediation is just how are we going to keep each other in the loop? What mm -hmm. does that look like? Mm -hmm. right? Because there are issues and they do come up and they're going to come up sometimes very quickly. Sometimes there's more time, but how do you make sure that you're doing things where you're supporting each other? Right. Just, just as an example. And, it can be isolating. It, re it can. Absolutely. And I've, so it's how to maintain, I'll, I'll go back to say again, it's, it's how to maintain those connections, how to maintain those relationships, even when we get stressed out. Right. And when the stress can get in the way, 
of our being able to do things together. Right, right. So again, thank you. And is there anything that you'd like to um, add in at the end or any suggestion for somebody that uh, they're not really sure about mediation? They're not really, uh, I can only imagine that there's, there's lots of people that would be a good fit for mediation and couldn't absolutely make use of the services. But at the same token, they're just not sure, you know, they're not used to reaching out to somebody else. They're not used to, to, to um, having to consider paying, you know, a professional just to, you know, work through, you know, we'll argue it out ourselves, right? You know, we'll, 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 we'll fight it out and et cetera. Um, why would, so, why would somebody, you know, reach out to you in the first place? It's a great question, and it's I think it's one of the great opportunities, and at the same time, one of the great challenges in this is that we tend to wait until things reach critical mass, until it becomes a crisis. Right. right? The best time, I used to say this as an attorney as well, the best time to talk things through or to, or to talk to me is before you need to talk to me. Yeah earlier interventions this is one of my goals and what i do is to try to help people be more on the preventive side as opposed to crisis management side both are important both have a role but it's the difference between fire prevention and firefighting on one level so ideally we can talk and address things before we have to when we can do it with more time perhaps more options in front of us. The options narrow the farther mm -hmm. along the path you go so right. often. And to what you're, what you're saying, Mark, as well, I think one of the biggest impediments is when people say, you know, this all sounds great, but not ready for that yet. And it's that yet that I think is where, where sometimes things come full stop. My question sometimes in response when, I, when we have these conversations is, What's your alternative? What's your plan B? What's the plan C? It's not to say you have to go one, A, B, or C, whichever that might be. You have to make the decisions for yourself, but to do it consciously. You don't have a lot of times where a family member will, will, will say, you know, that's just how we do things as a positive. Right. Right. right? So, so the opportunity sometimes is to change things from just doing it the way we've always done it. And like you said, muscling through mm -hmm. or finding a way that might open up a different path. So again, you know, for me, it's like the hidden value of the neutral, right? Because it's not just that you're not invested or vested in any particular individual's I got to have this, or I want to have that, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, it, it's, there's the negotiation skills, but it's also the, the ability to look at the whole um, of that, of that family. And um, from experience, um, if you're considering, if you're dealing with conflict or you're approaching the, the potential of, ha of, of having conflict, um, having that third party that is a neutral is not just an, from a standpoint of neutralizing some of the animus that, that can happen, but it's really looking at a word that you've used many times, and that is options. And options that you may not see because you're in the thick of it, right? So not only from a standpoint of being able to step back from and look at it from a larger, more holistic picture, but also having somebody who is trained in knowing what those options are and has the experience of working with others that have helped them shift their perspectives and, and, and see things in a way that um, uh, can find a path um, that, that is workable um, and, and is of support to all the parties involved uh, rather than just one party as an example. So. I mean, that's, you know, as I said, we drank the Kool-Aid. I've had, I've had, uh, we've had many, many mediators as clients over the years. Uh, and and uh, 
And so I, <laughs> um, it's, uh, I, really, I really believe that mediation needs to be at the forefront, not, you know, yes, there's legal, there's legal concerns, but a lawyer is not necessarily the, you know, not the be all and end all because you mentioned it, you know, there's finances, there's property, there's, um, uh, and, and, and the bigger component is, is the entire emotional and family engagement and kids, et, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, what's, what's an attorney uh, going to do? You know, they're, they're going to, they're going to advocate and there's times that it, that needs to, that needs to be the case. But, um, even I know many mediators that always encourage people to, you know, to have outside counsel that, that can review agreements and things like that. But um, the legal profession is not designed to um, look at the whole picture. It's not designed to look at the, the, the family and, and realize that, you know, it's, it's, it's winning in court it's, or it's winning, you know, through, through, through negotiation for one party or the other, but too oftentimes the kids get left behind. Um, um, if, if not far worse than that, actually. Um, so. Yeah, look, me mediation is not about winning. And I think that's, that's part of what, like, like you're saying, what makes it so powerful is it, it helps shift things from a dialogue where there is a winner, my way or your way, that or. Mm -hmm. Right. It's going to be my way or your way. I, I, it's one or the other right. to one where you could find an and right. Something that will work for everyone or at least that everyone can live with. And that and might be something that neither of you have thought of and an adversarial process where you are trying to defend or trying to advocate for one outcome. That's your hill. Mm -hmm. That's very different than saying, let's look at what's possible. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the big differences that you're that you're highlighting and, and that between going through a process, which is an, an adversarial negotiation or an adversarial legal process versus mm -hmm. one that's a cooperative problem solving. It's, it's at the end of the day, it's assembling a solution right. and looking beyond perhaps what you might have thought of to say, you know what, I'm going to take some of what you've thought of some of what I've thought of and some of what we've thought of, and maybe I'm assembling something different. I think it's the difference. People sometimes talk about solutions like they're, we're assembling a puzzle, mm -hmm. right? If you're a, if you're a puzzle person, right? Puzzles right. get us in, the pieces fit together one way in a mm -hmm. puzzle. I tend to think of mediation more and, and you can see here again, where I'm a parent Legos mm -hmm. mediation helps you spread out all of those pieces on the table. Then you step back and you say, how do we want to put these together? Right. right. It opens up the options as far as I'm concerned in a right. different way. Right. To something that may look entirely different than what you made that hill that you were ready to die on to, uh, to have it be a specific <laughs> outcome um, to an outcome that actually works for everybody. Um, right. So, Eric, it's been a delight to have you. Um, thank you again, folks. Every, as mentioned, all of uh, all the ways that you can reach out to Eric, as well as that you can get free information that you've made available through YouTube and LinkedIn and uh, your website, etc. Uh, all those links will be associated with this. Um, uh, my best to you, and 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 I do acknowledge you for um, making this transition over the last several years um, into something that I believe uh, is critical for making the world a better place. And uh, appreciate having you on today, Eric. Thanks so much for having me, Mark. You've been listening to Inspiring Business with your host, Mark Bullock. Your positive comments, likes, and most importantly, your sharing of this show with others is greatly appreciated. Don't forget to subscribe to the Inspiring Business Podcast on whatever platform you prefer. You can catch prior episodes on videosocials.net and on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, and all the major podcast platforms.